o'clock, so I'm going to get started here in just a second. Uh, again, thank you all for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoy these. I hope you get a lot out of these. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you today about hydrangea care and maintenance. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to try not to get into specific varieties um, per se of all the different hydrangeas because there's just so many out there. I'm going to try and keep it kind of buckled down to uh, what you probably really need to know, which I know is pruning, how to change the color of your hydrangeas. If you want to change the color, can you change the color? Um, different things like that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about pruning and when to prune. Uh, I know that's probably one of the most common questions we get here at the Garden Center, is when do I prune my hydrangeas? Uh, so we'll get into those details. And if you have any issues, we'll talk a little bit about disease and insect issues as well, uh, because that can occur on hydrangeas. However, they're a pretty low maintenance shrub. So that's kind of what I want to first start out is, is it's one of my favorite shrubs um, to grow in the garden, um, because it's just got that classic look, they bloom in the summer with these great blooms, and there's so much variety. You can see all the different ones here. we got pink ones, white ones, purple, blue. I mean, the colors are amazing. The size of the blooms can be enormous. I mean, this one's great. I will show all of these to you. Um, and there's just so many different types now, and there's so many new varieties that are coming out every year. So that's what's really cool about hydrangeas is they continue to evolve and continue to get better and better. Um, and so we're very, very excited to continue to offer a great uh, source of hydrangeas locally as well as uh, some information on on maybe you bought a house that has a hydrangea um, so great option there um, it's also a great uh, cut flower so it makes an amazing cut flower I'm sure if you have a hydrangea you get so many blooms they make great cut flowers they're very easy to cut they usually come on a nice long stem you can make great arrangements with just hydrangeas or adding them into another floral arrangement very very easy to use um, for that purpose, um, as well as just an amazing plant in, in the landscape. Now you can also grow them in containers. There's a lot of new varieties out there. I mean, really you can grow almost any of them in containers. Um, so if you've got a, a porch or a patio or a deck or you live in a condo and you just love hydrangeas, you still have the opportunity to grow hydrangeas. Uh, most of them will grow in pots for many, many years. Um, so a great option there as well to be able to grow them in containers. Um, let's talk about where we place hydrangeas in the landscape or what kind of requirements they like. Uh, for sure, they definitely love afternoon shade. So typically hydrangeas, for the most part, are going to like morning sun and then afternoon shade. Um, so that is something to kind of remember when you're looking around your landscape, looking around your yard and where you might want to place them, um, that they get a little bit of afternoon shade. Now there's a couple varieties, some specifics that I'll get into here as we continue to go along that maybe might be able to take a little bit more sun. Um, but in general, they all like morning sun, afternoon shade. So again, you just want to protect them uh, for the most part during the hottest part of the day. So if you can get some shade on your hydrangeas uh, from that 11 noon, noon uh, to about 3 or 4 o'clock, that's the, that's the hottest part of the sun. That's when we want to protect them. They also like moist soil. So uh, you want to think about that. If you've got a really dry, shady spot, Hydrangeas are going to struggle there, uh, even though they're in the shade. Um, they might, you know, if, if you plant them around a big old tree that's got a big root system, might be difficult to get them established. It can be done. Just know that that's what you're going to be dealing with. Is a little bit more. You might encourage planting them with peat moss to help hold in some moisture, um, and then just realize that you might have to water them a little bit more. But we'll talk about that here in a second as I get into to, to planting them and how to plant. Um, but hydrangeas really, really do prefer afternoon shade. So that's just a general rule of thumb. If you see your hydrangea wilting excessively and it's wilting all the time, you might consider moving it. Um, so that might be something that, you talk, that we uh, talk about here when I get into the planting section, is how do we transplant hydrangeas if we think we might have put them in the wrong spot? That can happen. Um, real quick on containers. If you're growing hydrangeas in containers, that's a great option for you. Um, make sure to always use a potting soil. So that's definitely the, the number one most important thing. Whenever we plant anything in a container, we want to use potting soil. We don't want to use a topsoil, a compost. One of those are going to get too muddy, clog up the drain holes. We want to make sure our container has drain holes. But hydrangeas can live in containers for many, many years. And you can grow them in that nice big container. You know, Typically somewhere around a, let's say, 20, 24 inch container, somewhere in that 10 to 12, 15 gallon size pot um, is going to be something that you're going to be able to grow a hydrangea in for many, many years. And there's some dwarfs now too. There's some dwarf styles that don't get very big. I'll show a couple of those to you as well. 
Uh, they only get maybe two to, two to three feet tall, which are great for containers. So you can always grow hydrangeas in containers. In a container, of course, we're going to have to watch our watering a little bit more. Uh, the nice thing about all hydrangeas is they'll tell you if they need water. So the leaves will kind of sag on you. They'll kind of hang a little bit. Great opportunity to go and just give them a nice deep soaking. And that's a great way in the landscape as well. So let's talk about how we plant them in the landscape. I just kind of want to always talk about general rule of thumb of how to plant them. Here locally, we of course have very heavy clay soil. And uh, so typically we're going to have a very heavy clay, which is a very good soil really. Uh, we just want to amend that soil. So if we're planting a hydrangea, we've got a great spot, but we know we've got heavy clay soil. We want to use compost and perlite with your soil. So that's what we always are going to recommend is make sure to use a compost. You can use a lot of different types of compost. We have a McDonald uh, Garden Center compost. That's a great organic compost. Uh, you can also use mushroom compost, cow manure. There's a lot of them out there. We've got a lot to choose from as well. But you want to amend your soil with compost. So when you dig your hole, dig it a little bit wider, no deeper. We never want to bury our plants. So we never want to put the root ball below grade. So I'll give you a, a quick example of that. You've got a hydrangea here. I don't want to bury the stems too deep. I want to put that soil that's on the top, so the root ball, when you take it out of this pot, you're going to have a root ball, and the top of that root ball needs to be level with your soil. Um, if anything, you can plant them always a little high just to be on the safe side, maybe an inch above grade. That's always a safe measure just so if it settles or something over time, you're not going to have to worry about it getting below grade. What happens is when they sink or get below grade, uh, soil builds up on the root system, builds up on the top of the root system there. And that can cause the plant to suffer over time because all the little tiny roots that are on the top surface like to dry out quicker. Covering them with mulch is perfectly fine, but we don't want to cover them with dirt. So never bury your plants. Always plant them level, maybe a little high. Uh, so we're going to dig our hole wider, but no deeper. And then we're going to take that soil and just add compost into it and perlite. Perlite are those little white styrofoam things you see in pine soil. Those are going to break apart the soil and allow air into the soil, allow water to percolate, allow the root system to take. But you do want to use your soil as well. So it's a third of your soil, a third of compost, and a third of perlite. That's the perfect mixture to fill it back in. If it gets used to your soil, if it's got a little bit of your soil in the area, as that root system gets bigger and expands outside of the soil that you've amended, then it'll be well established enough to be able to deal with that soil and grow right into it perfectly fine. So we always want to amend our soil. Now at the time of planting, I will always recommend our Biotone Starter, a Spoma Biotone Starter. Uh, this is an amazing fertilizer, plant food, great source of nutrients right away. What the best thing about this is, is it's got beneficial bacteria and mycorrhizae, and these attach themselves to the root system of your plant, and they form a symbiotic relationship, which is an amazing way of building a great, huge root system very quickly. It's going to relieve a lot of that transplant shock. So I know you pr probably are going to get the biggest selection of hydrangeas locally uh, when they're blooming, which is, you know, kind of mid to late spring, maybe even into the summer. And so you're going to deal with a little bit of that, what we call transplant shock, where it's not quite the best time to plant, but it's the best time to find the best source of hydrangeas, because when our garden center is going to carry plants, when they're blooming. And so we've got a great selection right now. Uh, we usually do all the way through the, the summer season, uh, but really from Mother's Day, to about Memorial Day is a great time to pick up hydrangeas. After Memorial Day, still an amazing time because we have a great selection as we continue to find more here and there. Um, so using Biotone Starter is a great way to kind of get that root system going and really rolling on you. Now, then of course we want to mulch. So we always want to mulch our plants. It's going to keep the weed suppression down. It's going to keep the weeds out of our flower bed or our garden. You can even mulch in containers. It's a great way to kind of finish off the pot, make it look really nice and neat and clean. It'll keep weeds out of your container, and it'll keep moisture in. So that's, of course, the benefit of when we use mulch in our landscape. Not only does it make it look pretty, keep the weeds out, but it also evens out the temperature and the moisture in your soil. So we definitely want to mulch our hydrangeas uh, because it'll help regulate the moisture, help keep some moisture in, keeps the root system cool in the summer, keeps the root system warm in the winter. So a great thing to do is mulch, of course. So we always want to mulch. And then as we continue to go, we want to fertilize. So we want to continue to feed our plants as they need nutrients to produce these huge blooms. Uh, we want to continue to, to feed our plants. And of course, we have our McDonald green leaf. So we've got our traditional green leaf formula, as well as our organic green leaf. These are both great fertilizers, plant foods for your plants. You can also use, let's see if I got it right here. You can also use Hollytone. So we'll talk about this a little bit as we talk about changing the pH. 
But holly tone is a great uh, plant food for hollies, azaleas, and hydrangeas. And this, of course, is going to make your soil a little bit more acidic, which is going to turn our hydrangeas a little bit more on the blue color. We'll get to that in a minute as we talk about changing our color. But that's another good one. So if you've got holly tone laying around, great option. Always a great option for pretty much any plant in our area uh, because of all of our trees and shrubs and perennials are going to be okay with an acidic kind of soil because that's what we typically have in this area. So holly tone is a great plant food option for you. Um, but the McDonald green leaf formulas are amazing. I love them so much because they have some of those smaller trace elements that a lot of our soil lacks. So it's got magnesium and boron and copper and zinc and molybdenum and all these different things uh, that go along with the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which are important, the macronutrients. But then we've got micronutrients in ours. So these are a great option to be able to just feed all your plants, especially hydrangeas. So that's how we do that. And we typically are going to do these somewhere around the two to three mark, two to three week mark after we've used our uh, biotone starter. So we're going to use our biotone starter at the at the time of planting because we want to get those mycorrhiza and beneficial bacteria right to the source of the root system. So that's why we want to use this at the time of planting. Then we're going to wait about two or three weeks and come back with just a regular plant food like our McDonald green leaf. And that's really it. And then we're going to water. So if we've just planted a new hydrangea, water deep less often. I can't stress that enough. It's the best way to water. Water deep less often. And that's what that's going to do is develop a root system. Now in a container, water your plant. You know you've soaked it really good. Water's coming out the bottom. Uh, you've got the drainage holes. You know that it's contained. You know the water is contained within that pot. So it's very easy to know that you watered it enough. In the landscape, in the ground, it's a little bit more difficult to know how much we've watered it. So the best advice I can give you is to take a hose, drop it at the base of the plant, turn on the, the spigot. Don't turn it on full blast. Don't turn it on a tiny little trickle um, and just let it soak. And typically, you know, this is going to be about a two or three gallon size container. Most of your hydrangeas are going to come in that size. Sometimes you'll get some one gallon, sometimes you'll get some five gallons, depends on the type of plant. But typically somewhere in the 10, 15, 20 minute range is how long we're going to let that soak. That's a really deep watering. But what that's going to do is get water all the way down to the bottom of the root system. But it's also going to allow you to not have to water every single day. We always want to water the root system. We never want to water the leaves. Most plants don't take moisture in through their leaves. They're going to take it in through the root system. So we always, we don't want to stand there with a hose and just broadcast it over top of the plant. We want to put it down at the base, water the plant, let it sit there, go do another task, go do some weeding, go do some cleaning up, do some pruning, and come back and move it to another one if we need to. And that's a great way to water your hydrangeas if you've got big old ones um, that maybe are a little stressed out during a drought time. Take your hose, drop it on there. You know, you might even be able to turn up the volume a little bit on your spigot to allow it to really get out there, but then you can really soak your hydrangea and you can leave it on there for 30, 45 minutes. Really give it a deep water and then you won't have to water again for a long time. Um, and what is going to happen is when that soil around it is drying out and it needs moisture, it's going to start to search for it. So if we give it a little bit of water every day or every other day, it's going to come to expect it. So it's going to sit there. The root system is just going to sit there and say, I'm going to get my water. I know what's going to happen. I've been getting it every two days for the past you know, month, two months. So you always want to start cutting off your water. You want to give it that time to dry out. And like I said, hydrangeas are amazing because they're going to tell you when they need water. So I really let them go to the point of where they're wilting. So if you start to see those leaves kind of turn down and starting to sag and wilt a little bit, and you check your soil and it's, and it's dry, then give it a good deep soaking and then wait till it wilts again. Because what's happening is those root systems are searching, that root system is looking for water. And when it's looking for water, it's building a bigger root system and it's getting out there and starting to grow. And that's how you get a plant established much quicker. Just watch your hydrangeas through the summer. If you get them through the first summer after planting, you shouldn't need to water them much again after that unless we're experiencing very you know, dry times. Now, if it's wilting and you check the soil and it's moist, then it might just need to dry out. So sometimes wilting doesn't always mean that it's dry. Sometimes wilting can mean it's too wet. If we don't let it dry out, if we go and give it more moisture, we can cause root rot, which we don't want. So real simple, hydrangeas are pretty tough. You're not gonna deal with a lot of root rot issues. They can take a very moist condition, but when we're getting them established, we wanna water, let them dry out. 
So there's some quick planting tips for you. Um, so the next thing I want to do, or what I'll tell you now, is, is I'm going to go through some types of hydrangeas. There's lots of different types. I'm going to talk about the main groups, the five, uh, six, I think there are six, yep, yeah, six of the main types of hydrangeas. And then we're going to talk about how to change the color. And then I'm going to talk about pruning. And then I'm going to talk about just general care and maintenance with disease and insects, if we have any of those issues. So let's get into the types of hydrangeas. Types of hydrangeas, there's lots of them out there. I'm going to kind of corrugate them, or I'm going to group them into six categories that might not make a ton of sense, and I'm not going to harp on it too much. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Uh, I just want you to know that there are some varieties out there, uh, or some, some these groups out there, um, that are kind of important to note, and it might help you identify what type of hydrangea you have in your yard. I think that's one of the most common questions, like I said, we get is, when do I prune my hydrangea? What type do you have is our next question. And then, I don't know. So hopefully this helps you identify the hydrangea that you might have, or if you're thinking about getting one, the type that you might want. So the first one is our big leaf hydrangeas. So if we're ever looking at hydrangeas, you're gonna see lots and lots of different names on them, lots of different varieties. Big leaf hydrangeas are typically your mop head. So your mop head is gonna get this big mop head type of bloom on it. And this one right here, you can see this big bloom. So let me see if I can kind of show you this. This will be the time where I'll start moving some things around. So here you go, there's just your mop head bloom. You can see that big bloom there. So mop heads, big leaf hydrangeas, or hydrangea macrophylla is the Latin name. Again, we're not gonna get super scientific here, not gonna get super specific, but your mop heads, your typical hydrangeas. Now there will be some lace caps that will fall into that group. Lace caps, let me describe what a lace cap is here for you real quick. Let me see, this one's a pretty good example here. See if you can see that white bloom. So this is a lace cap. So you can see the lace cap, all the blooms on the outside are gonna open up and then there's gonna be some in the center that never open up. That's completely normal, that's what a lace cap does. Whereas a mop head is gonna be this big ball, this big moppy kind of bloom. Um, and they can get any size from, you know, a small, baseball size bloom up to, I mean, I've seen them as big as, uh, you know, almost a soccer ball. So, I mean, you can get huge ones. I mean, this one is big. So, I'll show you a little bit more of these as I continue to move around. But your mop heads, big leaf hydrangeas, hydrangea macrophylla, those are probably one of the most common, one of the most sought after hydrangeas, but that is one group. The next one would be oak leaf. So, oak leaf hydrangeas are a completely kind of different group. There's not a whole lot of varieties in that. There's a ton of varieties in our big leaf, but I'll show you what an oak leaf hydrangea looks like. As you can see here, this is an oak leaf hydrangea. And there's, again, there's not a ton of varieties. There's Alice or uh, there's a couple other different ones out there, Snow Queen, lots of different ones. Some say they can regulate the size a little bit. Typically in the Hampton Roads area, they're going to get somewhere between four to six, seven feet tall. And why? They're pretty big hydrangeas. They're gorgeous with this huge leaf, this big oak style leaf. You can see that leaf right there. So huge leaves, awesome, awesome plants. Um, I wish I had one that was blooming in the store. I don't, but they're going to have a very pyramidal cone-shaped bloom and they're going to be big and oak leaf hydrangeas can get big. Now you can keep them smaller. So if you were always wanted an oak leaf hydrangea and you're like, well, I want it to be about four by four, you can definitely keep an oak leaf about that size and we'll talk about that more in the pruning section. Um, but oak leaf hydrangeas are in a class by their own and this is what they look like. They are absolutely stunning. They have white blooms. They're always going to be white. You cannot change the color of these blooms whereas you can with some of the other varieties. And again, we'll talk about that when we get into changing the color. Uh, but oak leaves are going to be big, white, pyramidal, cone-shaped blooms, really, really pretty blooms. Uh, oak leaves can take a little bit more sun. So if you've always had a little bit more of a sunny condition, but you've always wanted a hydrangea, this might be a good option for you. Now, they can get big. I've seen them down south get somewhere anywhere in that 10 to 12 foot range. They can get monster. They can get huge, but you can keep them smaller as well. Um, so this is a really, really good hydrangea. If you have a little bit of a sunnier location, this might be a great option for you. Um, and a really nice one. What I really love about oak leaf hydrangeas, though, is the fall color. It's amazing. So these actually turn bright red in the fall. So this, all these leaves will turn bright, bright red before they drop off. So really, really cool oak leaf hydrangea in a class by itself. It's all by itself. So then the next one that we're going to talk about are climbing hydrangeas. Again, a very simple class. 
I've got one right here. So don't need to kind of show you. They're not blooming. They typically don't bloom very well in containers. This is going to be one that you're going to want to plant in the landscape, uh, whether you've got a trellis, a fence, a brick wall, a wood fence, a wood wall, whatever. It'll climb on all of those. Um, they do have little aerial roots on them, so those will actually attach themselves to a wall, um, and, but it's typically not going to hurt it. So it's not like ivy. Ivy, I know people are worried about ruining your brick walls, um, but typically it's not going to hurt it. Um, if you are worried, of course, plant it on a trellis or plant it on a wood fence, um, but it does have little aerial roots that will kind of grab on uh, and allow it to cling and grow on any surface or most surfaces. Um, so a really good option. Again, life's shade, so you're going to want afternoon shade on this plant. We don't want to grow this on a south-facing wall, a west-facing wall. We want east or north, um, and we don't want it to get a lot of sun or underneath a tree, somewhere where it's going to get a little bit of uh, shade in the afternoon. So climbing hydrangeas are in a group all by themselves. Now these will bloom almost always with a white bloom again. Uh, so a white blooming hydrangea, it's a vine loves shade, and it gets a lace cap, so it's going to be more along the lines of what this bloom is doing here. It's going to be a lace cap, and they are gorgeous when the whole wall is in bloom. Just an amazing plant. Really interesting in the winter, so when the leaves fall off in the fall, late fall, early winter, um, really interesting bark texture, uh, really kind of a cool looking vine, whether you're growing it on a trellis or a wall. Really, really nice. It's not an overly aggressive vine, so it's not something that you can't maintain and keep smaller if you need to. Uh, but I've seen them cover the entire side of an old brick home, and it's amazing uh, to see that hydrangea blooming uh, in that mid-spring time frame is typically when these are going to bloom. Uh, somewhere around that Mother's Day to Memorial Day time frame is when uh, your, your um, climbing hydrangeas will bloom. Again, it's a white bloom. You can't change the color. Not much you can do there. There's a few different varieties. Typically, we're just going to carry just the climbing hydrangea. I know there's one called Moonlight that was pretty popular a while ago just because the leaf was slightly different. Um, but this is one of the most reliable blooming uh, climbing hydrangeas. It's just your typical climbing hydrangea. Again, they're in a group all on their own. Now, the next one is going to be mountain hydrangeas. So what are mountain hydrangeas? I mean, typically, again, something that you're not going to hear about a lot. Um, it's hydrangea serrata. Um, again, kind of don't worry so much about the Latin names or anything like that. Mountain hydrangeas um, are typically lace caps. So you're going to see more mountain hydrangeas that are more of this lace cap look. So here is a mountain hydrangea, just so you can see it. And you can see all those little lace cap blooms. I love lace caps. What's really cool about mountain hydrangeas is mountain hydrangeas are very tough. So actually this one is made by Proven Winners and it's called Tough Stuff. Uh, tough stuff, and that's because it's very, very durable. So mountain hydrangeas think, you know, they're dealing with a little bit more of the, the variable conditions. So typically going to get colder, so one of your colder, hardy varieties of uh, hydrangea or your mountain hydrangeas. Uh, typically going to be a lace cap, um, and typically are going to be repeat bloomers as well. So again, we'll get into that here in a minute when I talk about changing the blooms, all that different type of bloom stuff. Um, but mountain hydrangeas are a great option. Some are going to look very similar to a, to a typical big leaf hydrangea. They're going to be hard to identify. Again, we don't need to worry so, so much about all of these. You'll understand in a minute when I get to the pruning section why I kind of, I'm going to go over these um, so that you can kind of understand that. Again, we're, you want a pretty hydrangea. You've got lots and lots of different options, so we don't have to get too, too specific about specific types. Now, if you're further up north, and you want a very cold hardy, then mountain hydrangeas, uh, hydrangea serrata might be the better option for you. But again, most of them are going to be perfectly fine in all zones across the United States. They grow very well pretty much everywhere. The southern, southern tip of Florida, you might have a difficult time, and way up into Canada, you might have a time. Um, but pretty much all of the United States do very well with hydrangeas. I'll mention real quick, since I'm on it, the zones, they typically grow anywhere from zones four to nine. Uh, so right here in Hampton Roads, do very, very well. Further up north, you just want to be a little bit more careful. If you start to get into zones four or five, you might want to look for a tougher one like the mountain hydrangea. So that's why I wanted to point that one out. Now we're going to talk about the panicle hydrangeas. So the panicle, um, which are hydrangea um, paniculata. Um, so again, Latin names, don't worry about it. But these are going to be probably the ones that I think a lot of people are really excited about these days, which are going to be like your limelight hydrangeas, your white blooming. Uh, it's going to have that cone-shaped flower. So this is a paniculata right here. 
I'll pull this one over so we can see a little bit better. Now this one's, I believe, called, I want to say it's uh, Flame. Um, so let me check out the name. Lava Lamp Flare. So this one, but really what I want to show you is this is what a paniculata looks like. A panicle style hydrangea. Now again, this is just coming out. We don't have a lot of blooms on it yet, uh, but you can see that pyramidal cone-shaped bloom. So let me hold that up with the background so you can kind of see it. So it's a cone-shaped bloom, and these can get large. They can get lots of different uh, um, uh, styles. They're almost all white. So PG is another name you might have heard of. PG hydrangeas is what some people will group all the panicle style hydrangeas together. If you've ever seen a tree style hydrangea, the trunk with the top, the little lollipop top with all those white blooms all over it, that's a panicle style hydrangea. Limelight is what you're seeing back here. So again, these blooms are just coming out, so you can't quite see all the color because, or all the white of uh, the bloom because they're just starting out. Now they're called limelight because they have a limeish color to them. Um, but um, there's lots and lots of different styles of these out there. There's little lime, limelight, they get pretty good size. This one's called lava lamp flare. There was one called strawberry, I think, for a little bit. Uh, so again, there's a lot of different varieties out there. Now what's really cool about this group of hydrangeas is if you ever really want to try a hydrangea in full sun, this is probably one of the most durable. So your panicle style, your paniculata, your PG hybrids of uh, hydrangeas, this is going to be your best shot of doing them in full sun. And I know a lot of us are very excited about these. There's a lot of different types out there. Uh, they're very easy to grow. They're very low maintenance. Um, they do require, of course, you know, the same requirements of a little bit of moisture. Now, you can grow these in shade, too. So if you've got a shady spot, they do amazing in shade. Um, so one of the best shade plants out there. Uh, but this is another type of, of hydrangea is the panicle, pyramidal blooms, cone-shaped blooms, always white. Um, we'll talk about pH here in a minute. That might affect these a little bit. Uh, but other than that, that's pretty much it on the panicle style. So again, I want to try and get through all these different styles so that I can start to talk about some of the information that you probably really want to know, which is how to prune them and how to change the pH and all those different types of things. Um, so then the last one is called smooth hydrangeas. Smooth hydrangeas you don't see as many of anymore. Some people might call them wild hydrangeas. Wild hydrangeas uh, is kind of a group. Smooth leaf hydrangeas. Now they say they're smooth leaf. Uh, it's a little bit of a lighter colored leaf, so it's not going to give you this big serrated green leaf that you typically see with a hydrangea. I've got one down here. I've just got a small one. Again, this is not something that we typically carry a lot of here at the Garden Center anymore. Uh, Annabelle was a very popular variety if you have an Annabelle in your yard. Incredible was another type of smooth hydrangea. But smooth hydrangeas are going to have a little bit of a lighter leaf. You're going to see it's a little bit of a softer leaf. Uh, they're, they're still kind of, you know, typically on that kind of fuzzier side. But smooth hydrangeas typically are going to have a white bloom again. They're going to be more upright, so this one's just a small little guy, a little uh, you know, young plant, uh, but typically they're going to be very vertical, and they're not going to be a complete globe-shaped bloom typically. They're going to flatten a little bit, so instead of that nice round ball that you get with like a mop head, you're typically going to get a slightly flatter bloom with these. Again, you're not going to see as many of the smooth hydrangeas out uh, in garden centers. Uh, they do require afternoon shade for sure, um, and they're not quite as sought after as the pinnacle style or the big leaf varieties, the mop heads, the lace caps, the mountains. Um, there's, a, again, a lots of different types of hydrangeas out there. I just kind of wanted to go over briefly all the different classes. There's kind of six major groups, and you'll understand Sam, why when I get to my pruning section, why I kind of wanted to go over those with you. And again, I hope this helps identify what you might have around your home if you've purchased a home or if you've got a hydrangea and you're not quite sure what it is. Hopefully this helps you kind of describe or, or figure out what type of hydrangea you have because that will be important to know as we get to the pruning section. So we've got big leaf, your mop head hydrangeas, oak leaf, a class by their own, climbing hydrangeas, a class on their own. Then we've got the mountain hydrangeas, which are going to be very similar to a, a, a big leaf as far as the leaf look and the look of the plant. Um, very, very similar. Typically going to be more lace caps, but you will see some mop heads in there, and you'll see lace caps in the big leaves. So again, let's not get too, too specific here. And then we get into the panicle style, which are white blooms in that cone shape. And then we've got our smooth hydrangeas. So again, those are the groups. 
Don't worry about it too, too much, but I hope maybe that helps you identify what you might have at home. Um, so if, if we're trying to figure out what, what, what you've got in your yard, maybe that'll help kind of determine which ones you've got. Uh, so now let's talk about changing the color of our hydrangeas. So let's first start with the easy thing, which is your white blooming hydrangeas. White blooming hydrangeas you're not going to be able to change the color of. So white blooming hydrangeas um, are always going to be white. You're not going to be able to do anything about that. Now, if you do need to make them a little bit whiter, so a lot, a lot of times you might experience a green bloom on your white hydrangea. Um, now, typically that will happen as it fades. So let's talk about that real quick. White blooming hydrangeas will come out in a very lime kind of color, a lime kind of bud. You can see that there. It's very lime in color. Um, and you can see it, of course, in the limelight. As they open up, it opens to a white bloom, and that white bloom is going to be very white. Now, if it's not as white and it's getting a little bit staying kind of that lime green color, you can use magnesium sulfate. So remember that, magnesium sulfate, I forgot to grab a bag, but magnesium sulfate will keep your hydrangeas, your white hydrangeas, a little bit more crisp and white. Now, it doesn't have to be that. If you like your hydrangea, you don't have to use magnesium sulfate. It's just an option if you're seeing, oh, my white hydrangea doesn't seem like it's as white as it used to be. Magnesium sulfate will make it a little bit more white if you're losing a little bit of that color. Now, as the bloom continues to age and get older, it will start to fade to a color of your pH, typically. Again, depends on the type of hydrangea. Smooth hydrangeas might not do it as much, but the panicle styles will, and oak leaves sometimes will. Some, most oak leaves, as they fade, they fade to green, because it's, again, a white blooming hydrangea. We can't change the color. But on your panicle style, they'll always fade to either a light blue, if we have acidic soil, or a light pink, if we have alkaline soil. So it's a great way of kind of telling what kind of soil you've got. As your color fades out of your white bloom, as it starts to get older, and that bloom starts to get older, it'll fade to one of those colors depending on your pH. Not a huge importance. Most people aren't going to change their pH uh, just because they want their, their white blooms to fade to a certain color. As it goes even older, it'll start to revert back to that lime green color again. And then, of course, it'll die off. Um, it'll go dormant. Um, the bloom will fade and go brown. And we'll talk about that in the pruning section about if we need to prune that off or not. Um, but that's your white blooms, so you really can't do much with them. Um, a, a very famous one, I don't have any in stock right now, um, but it's called Blushing Bride. Blushing Bride is the reason they call it a Blushing Bride. Now it's a mop head, it's a big leaf hydrangea, but Blushing Bride will blush to that color depending on your pH. So there's white hydrangeas even in our big leaf varieties. So again, whites are in almost all of them, um, but uh, typically you're going to always get white and you're not going to be able to change the color of that bloom. All you can change is the pH or change the, the fading color, the blush color that comes at the end of that bloom cycle. So let's talk about our mop heads, um, our big leaf hydrangeas, the ones that we can change the color. Those are, again, determined on pH. So pH, of course, is a range of 0 to 14. I think we all know the scale. Um, hopefully nobody's at a 0 to 14. That would be bad. Uh, we're typically in Hampton Roads somewhere around a 4.5 to 6.5, somewhere in that 2-point range, 4.5 being pretty low, uh, 6.5 being very average, 5.5 is right about where we almost all are. If we planted a hydrangea in this area and you drive around and see hydrangeas, you almost always are going to see blue hydrangeas. It's very common in this area. If you plant your hydrangea and you get blue, you know that your pH is below a 6. So that's where our range, so you would think 7 or below would be, it is acidic, would be blue. But really, in the 6 down to 4, 3, is going to be blue. So those are going to be, that's going to be our ranges. Anything below a 6 is going to be a blue hydrangea. Anything between a 6 and a 7 is going to be a mix of pink and blue or purple. So typically some hydrangeas will get more of that purple color. And you can kind of see that right here with this bloom. You're going to get a little bit of that mauve kind of purple color. Or you're going to get a shrub that has pink and blue blooms on one plant. That can happen when our pH is in between 6 and 7. Anything above a 7, then we're getting into the pink range. The higher we go, the more we get into like the reds. So if you see this kind of reddish color bloom here, that's as we get a higher into pH. Um, so again, we can change the color of our, of our hydrangeas. Now if you've got 
a pink or a blue hydrangea, and you want to go the opposite direction, what do we need to do to our soil to change the pH? So lime, of course, is what we use to change our pH if we have acidic soil and we want to bring it up. And so I brought this package just because it shows a pink hydrangea on it. Um, soil acidifier um, is sulfur. So let's see, do I have that? Yep. So we've got aluminum sulfate, which is one type of sulfur, or just regular soil sulfur. Um, and of course, Espoma makes one as well called soil acidifier. And that's going to bring your pH down. So if you have pink hydrangeas, you want to bring your pH down, you want to get those blue hydrangeas, then we need soil sulfur. We need either soil acidifier from Espoma or one of the soil sulfurs from high yield will change your pH, bring your pH down, give you blue hydrangeas. To make them pink, we've got a lot of blue hydrangeas here. We have very acidic soil, so if you want to bring your pH up, you can use garden lime, which will bring your pH up. So that's a good option. Now if you want to do it a little bit quicker, and I'll talk about speed here in a second, I don't know if I grabbed that there. Magical. So Magical is basically calcium, but it does the same thing as lime. It's going to raise your pH, and it does it much faster. So let's talk about when we want to do this. So if you've got a pink hydrangea, I've got these pink blooms. I want to make them, I want to make them blue. You're not going to be able to get it this year. <laughs> so unfortunately, you, you, you don't have the time to do it this year. But what you want to do is remember that. And you can go ahead and change your pH now. So if you're like, I really want this to be pink or blue next year, then I need to go get my soil acidifier now. I need to go get my soil sulfur, my soil acidifier, get it down. It takes time to change pH in your soil. So it's not going to happen this year. So we always tell people to remember, try and remember in January and February when you're not doing a lot in the yard. That would be about the latest that you want to do it to change your pH. But you can do it now. So you can start working on getting your pH in the right range. Now here at McDonald Garden Center we do free pH tests, so if you're curious about what pH you are in, you just bring a little bit of soil from that area around your hydrangea, we can check what your pH is and tell you. However, your blooms should be telling you what color it is. Uh, so if you got blue or acidic, you got pink, you're alkaline. And we'll tell you how to change those colors if that's something that you want to do. Very easy to do, it's just not going to happen overnight. We can't change pH that quickly in your soil. Now the good, the good news, is, or what I want to tell you, which is kind of important, um, is Magical is a great option to change your pH fast. This will change your pH in about a month. So if you come in around March or April and you're like, I forgot, I really want to make my soil more sweet, which is what we call that, and we raise the pH, I really want to make my blue hydrangeas pink, we can do it pretty quickly with Magical. The downfall of Magical is it's not going to last quite as long. So it's not a pure lime like our dolomitic garden lime. Dolomitic garden lime is going to change your pH much quick, or it's going to take longer to change your pH, but it's going to last longer. So this is a great one. You're going to have to put this down at least by January or February to get your colors um, ought to change to a pink color from blue if we want to do that with our hydrangeas. And then the same with aluminum sulfate or soil sulfur or a sponoma soil acidifier. We want to give it some time to change that pH. Um, it's going to take some time. So typically with, with uh, your pH trying to bring it down, uh, we're typically going to get there within about a two to three month time frame as well. So again, if your hydrangeas, which they should be blooming, um, if they're blooming and they're gorgeous, um, and you want to change the color next year, remember you can go ahead and start that process. Now, you're just not going to get it this year, and we can help you get there. Um, so that's how you change your pH. Uh, your hydrangeas are telling you what your pH is. A lot of people might have uh, you know, lawns, usually, nearby a hydrangea, and you might be getting pink hydrangeas. You're going to see more and more pink hydrangeas nearby a lawn section because most of your garden centers are going to tell you to put down lime to change your pH for your lawn, because lawn's like a 6.5. Well, in that 6.5 range, or if we get a little bit higher, because our spreader is spitting out the lime into our, into our uh, uh, flower beds, then you might have pink hydrangeas. You might say, I've got oak trees, I've got maples, I've got pines, my soil should be acidic, but you're putting down lime in your lawn, and it's spitting out underneath your hydrangeas, that might be the cause of it. Now, pH can regulate, pH can change throughout the yard. Sometimes you don't know why the pH is different. Also, when we talk about mulch, if you're using pine straw, um, or if you're using hardwood mulches, or pine bark nuggets, um, cedar, cypress, they're pretty much all going to change your pH 
into an acidic soil. So it's always going to lower your pH naturally. Now it's slow and it's not real aggressive, so it's not going to move at a point. But if you're using pine straw around your, or pine bark nuggets, or hardwood mulches, any of your mulches are typically going to lower your pH um, and it's going to start to make your pink hydrangeas blue. We might need to bring it back up by adding lime because almost all of our mulches are going to make your soil acidic. So that might be one of the reasons that you have to keep adding lime to keep your hydrangeas pink is because we have mulch that we're using that is making our soil a little bit more acidic. So that might help explain that as well. Uh, so that's really how we change our color of our pH. Now, let's get into the pruning topic. So this is a big one, this is a tough one. Pruning hydrangeas is tricky to know when to prune. Now how to prune is pretty easy. But when we talk about when to prune our hydrangeas, it's a little bit trickier. So the reason I kind of went through all those different classes of hydrangeas is to kind of tell you now about how to prune those hydrangeas. So let me kind of briefly go through that first group. We're talking about big leaf, Hydrangeas, mop heads, or lace caps, hydrangea macrophylla, the most common hydrangea that you're going to see out there. Um, big leaf hydrangeas are going to bloom on old wood. Oak leaf hydrangeas are going to bloom on old wood. Climbing hydrangeas are going to bloom on old wood. And then last, mountain hydrangeas are going to bloom on old wood. Now, I'm going to talk about what that means. Uh, what I remember when somebody first told me that, I said, well, what does old wood even mean? Uh, old wood means it's going to bloom on last year's growth. Everything that we're getting this year, this summer, on our hydrangeas, if you have one of those four types of hydrangeas, uh, everything that we're getting this year is what's going to bloom on next year. So, if we go and prune those hydrangeas this winter, we have pruned off all of last year's growth, and then we're not going to get many blooms this year. Now, that's not to say that you won't get any blooms, and the reason that I say that is because so many new hydrangeas have come out that we're getting repeat bloomers. We're getting a mix. So, even in our big leaf, our mountain hydrangeas, um, uh, typically not your oak leaves yet or your climbing hydrangeas. Again, they're kind of a separate class, oak leaf hydrangeas and climbing hydrangeas. Uh, you always want to, to prune in a, in a specific time frame. I'm going to tell you what that is in a second. But, if you prune your hydrangeas in the winter, and you're not getting as many blooms, if you prune them after they're done blooming, you will always get a bigger bloom production. And the reason is, so let's say I've got this hydrangea here. I'll pull this out in front of me so you can see it. I've got this hydrangea, it's blooming, it looks great. Um, it's bloomed, it's got a lot of blooms on it, but they're starting to fade. That's the best time to prune it. Uh, and what that does is, when will that be? Depends on your area, depends on the weather, depends on a lot of different things. But it's starting to fizzle, the blooms have kind of, it doesn't seem to be producing any more buds. Now this one is, I've got a bud here, I've got a bud here, I've got an old bloom here, so I can selectively prune this. But if I want to prune this to control the shape or the habit, um, then now would be the time, is as these blooms begin to fade. Because what I'm going to do, it, do is give it enough time to produce new growth that's going to harden off this winter and then that's what you're going to get blooms on next year. So that's what I want you to know is when we're talking about old wood, hydrangeas that bloom on old wood, we're talking about all that growth that you're going to get this year. So we can prune these as late as let's say uh, probably in this area, uh, probably August would be probably about the time that I would say you can prune, mid-August maybe. You want to give it enough time to reproduce growth, produce more stems before winter hits, because that will help you in the bloom production for next year. Now, as I said, there's a lot of hydrangeas out there. Let me see if i got an example here. I think a lot of us know the name Endless Summer. Endless Summers are repeat blooming hydrangeas. There's a lot of varieties out there, almost all varieties that you're going to get these days are going to be repeat blooming hydrangeas. And what that means is it will bloom on old growth and new growth. But again, if we prune in the winter, if we prune in the winter, you're cutting half of your blooms off. So I'll try and break this down again a little bit more simple. Old wood is going to be your first big bloom set. So on repeat blooming hydrangeas, they're going to bloom on old wood, and then they're going to produce new growth, and then they're going to bloom on that. So you're going to get kind of two sets of blooms with a repeat blooming hydrangea. Now typically they'll continue to spit out blooms here and there throughout that whole cycle, but your first big bloom set is going to be on last year's growth. 
then your next big bloom set is going to be on this year's growth. So if you prune them in the winter, again, you're going to prune off all that old wood. You're only going to get the new growth blooms. You're not going to get the old growth blooms. So if you've got a repeat blooming hydrangea, we definitely want to recommend to prune them um, in the, the summer after you've enjoyed the blooms. So what I always tell people is, you've got a gorgeous hydrangea, it's blooming, it looks great. Wait till the blooms begin to fade. Once they begin to fade, then that's when you can go prune. Now, how much can you prune? I never recommend pruning more than a third of the plant off if you can avoid it. But if you've got a seven, eight foot size, you know, huge hydrangea and you need to really cut it down to size, you can, especially if it's been in the ground for a long time. Prune it, you can cut it in half. I usually, again, to be safe, cut a third off because that way you're not cutting off so much of the plant, you're causing a major stress. If we do cut it really hard, then we want to give it something to kind of rebound from that. And so give it a little bit of a plant food to kind of give it some nutrients, give it a little bit of boost, make sure we're not doing it during a drought time. Don't do it in the middle of, you know, uh, you know, 95 degree week where we haven't had any rain. Don't go and prune your hydrangea really hard then. So pay attention to your weather. Give it a little bit of plant food. Get a little bit of water when you're done with it. You can even give it a great little product called Super Thrive, which takes the stress off of plants. We love that one. So if we ever do something that we were a little worried that might cause a little bit of stress, Super Thrive is a vitamin supplement that will help kind of take the stress off of a plant. So keep that in mind. But you can prune hydrangeas pretty hard. So that's when we want to prune that group of hydrangeas is in the summer. It's always the best time. Enjoy your blooms, take some in, enjoy them in a vase inside your home, dry them out, do whatever you want to do with your hydrangea blooms, but then give it a shear if we need to control the shape or size, and that's the best time to do it. Now, you don't have to. If you give hydrangeas plenty of space to grow in, you typically don't even have to prune hydrangeas. They'll get 3x3, three 4x4, three, 5x5, four five five, depending on the variety, depending on the size. You just let hydrangeas naturally grow. You don't ever have to really prune them. Now, checking in the winter for dead wood is a good option. You can always go through and find those kind of broken pieces of wood or old dead wood. You can also do that in the spring when all of it's starting to just leaf out. And you see all these nice little leaf buds showing up on all those stems, but you got a couple stems that have no leaf buds on them. It's a good idea to go in and take those out at that time. But now let's talk about your uh, panicle style hydrangeas, which are going to be like your limelights. Um, this one, that, that uh, flame. Uh, so you've got lots of different panicle styles, the white blooms, the ones that we can do a little bit more in sun. And then we've got our smooth hydrangea, which again, like I said, you're not going to see as many of them out there, but smooth hydrangeas and the limelight hydrangeas, those are going to be the ones, uh, the panicle style, that you want to prune in the winter. They only bloom on new growth. So they're only going to bloom on this year's growth. So by pruning it in the winter time frame, you're going to get nice big shoots coming out in the springtime, and that's what you're going to get that big huge bloom set on. So if you've got a limelight hydrangea, you want to prune that this winter. So you want to prune it late winter, early spring, somewhere in that, uh, let's say February, March time frame, depending again on your zone. The best way to also tell is, okay, I'm starting to see buds cracking. I'm starting to see leaf buds starting to crack out of that stem. That's a good time to go ahead and prune it. Now, if you're going up further north, I will tell you, uh, if you're you know, in that zone five, four or five, we typically don't recommend pruning hydrangeas if you can't, if you don't have to, uh, because that really can hurt the growth uh, of those plants, especially because you get late winter snaps. We had one this year. We have a late cold snap. Um, but that can happen up north a little bit more, so just kind of be careful of that. Again, that's why I typically are going to recommend a mountain hydrangea when you go further up north. But again, back to the panicle style the paniculata, the uh, mountain, or sorry, the smooth hydrangeas, so those white blooming hydrangeas, we want to typically prune those, exclude oak leaf, we want to typically prune those in the winter. Now, this will be my last statement on pruning, uh, well, maybe the last, is if you want to be very safe and you just want kind of an overall answer of when to prune hydrangeas, always the best time for me is to prune them in mid to late summer again so we have time for it to regrow so even if I prune a limelight hydrangea that I just said you should prune in the winter and you should it's the best time to do it late winter early spring it's going to give you all that new growth but if I'm trying to control the size and I just need a simple answer then as again as those blooms fade whatever time frame that might be in the summer could be now could be mid-august by the time your hydrangea blooms and you want and you're okay with cutting it at that point. 
then you can still prune these in that late summer, mid to late summer time frame. And the reason is, is it'll put out new growth throughout this year. It'll finish off, it'll harden off, and then next year you'll get new growth again. So it'll still bloom on that. Now the reason that if you prune these in the winter, you're going to get better bloom sets is because when you prune something and it gets a brand new burst of new growth and you're pruning into harder wood, if you're pruning into a thicker piece of stem, then you're going to get a bigger shoot of growth. So again, we kind of always think about uh, crepe myrtles. Uh, you know, we don't recommend the crepe myrtle, which is pruning it in the same exact spot every single year. We don't want to do that with any plant. Uh, pruning in the exact same spot every single year, you get these knuckly looking things. It can really hurt the plant over time. But if we're pruning to encourage bigger growth, crepe myrtles go through that as well. But hydrangeas, same thing. So if I go and I take this little bloom off, and I just take it right up up here by the tip, then I've got a little thin piece of wood that I've cut into. Now if I go down this stem, and I go into some thicker wood and cut it off, one, I've got a little bit nicer flower to use in a vase because I've got a longer stem. But from that thicker wood, I'm going to get a bigger shoot. I'm going to get a much stronger shoot of new growth, which is going to help when it's producing bigger blooms. So in the winter, if we can prune these in the winter, the panicle style, limelight is the most common one there. Um, little lime is another good one. Uh, but if we're pruning our panicle style or our smooth hydrangeas in late winter, it's going to erupt in the spring with big new growth, and then you're going to get nice big blooms on it. Now, if we prune those in late summer, you're still going to get new growth on them. It's going to harden off, and it's still going to produce blooms on it next year. Uh, it just might not be quite as vibrant as if you waited until the, the winter to prune it. So, two time frames, but in general, in general, just to be safe, we always want to prune hydrangeas after the flowers fade off. So again, sometimes that can be in the summer. If it's really, really intense heat, we just want to be careful. Wait a week, make sure it cools down. I see we're going to get some rain. Maybe it's a good time to prune because I see I'm going to get a good rain shower in the next couple days. So always be paying attention to that. Be mindful. If the plant is stressed out because we're in a drought or a very hot time frame, you wouldn't want to get cut either. So think about your plants. Think about how they're feeling. And that will kind of help you tell when the best time to, to, to prune them. And again, always ask us if you've got a question. Um, as far as like time of the day, you can prune hydrangeas really any part of the day. Again, if it's 95 degrees, full blazing sun, and the plant isn't in some shade, then maybe wait till the morning or the evening to prune it. Doesn't necessarily matter about the date or, or the timing of when you prune. Um, now, again, how much we prune is up to you. If we're just deadheading it, if we're just taking a bloom off, that's fine. You can do that anytime. I've got a plant, it's gorgeous, it's got lots of blooms on it, it's got one that's fa fading on me. You can go in there and snip that off. So if you like to work in your garden, but if we're trying to control the size, which I think is what most people are trying to do with their hydrangeas, it's gotten too big, I need to cut it down, I need to control the size of it, then we always want to wait until the blooms fade in the summer and prune it then. Unless you know specifically what type of hydrangea you have, and if you know that you've got a panicle style, then if you can wait till winter, late winter, early spring, that's the best time to prune those. So I know pruning can be complicated with hydrangeas, but that's how you do it. Now, let's talk about pruning off the deadheads, because a lot of people do and don't. It's personal preference. It really doesn't matter in our zone. Um, it specifically doesn't matter. Uh, a lot of people will leave the dried up flower heads on the bush, so when the plant loses all its leaves in the fall, and we've got these uh, blooms that are still on the plant and they're dried up, you can leave them on there. They will naturally fall off for the most part and actually provide a little fertilizer, a little plant food for your plant. Um, it's got a little bit of nitrogen in it, so that'll drop down. It'll help kind of, you know, the plant as it goes along. That's a natural way of doing it. A lot of us don't like the look of it, so you can go and take those off. So I know I said don't prune in the winter, but if you've got a lot of these brown tips, you just go and you just clip them off in the winter time frame. It'll just clean your plants up, make it look a little bit nicer and cleaner in that winter time frame. We're not doing major prunes, so we're not taking a mop head and taking and cutting off a bunch of it. Uh, we're not taking big, huge, major cuts on it. We're not shaping it in the winter because we're going to be cutting off our blooms for next year. But if we've got a bloom that's faded or we've got a, a bloom in the winter time frame or we've got a bunch of old dead heads on our, on our plant and we want to clean it up, just go in and clip it right off. That is not a problem at all. It's not going to hurt the plant, not going to hurt the bloom either. If you want to know a specific set of leaves to go down to, I usually say go to the second set of leaves if we're just taking off dried up blooms. 
We're just taking those off. Um, you can do it down to the second set of leaves, so you're going to see a leaf node in there. So go not to the first one, but the second one, perfectly fine there. Um, again, if we're shaping hydrangeas, we're typically going and taking bigger cuts off and really bringing them back down to size. And then it's not a super exact science. Again, I always say never take more than a third. You're always safe there. If you've got an old hydrangea been in the ground for a long time, you can usually take it down to half if you need to. And that'll help. Um, um, it'll still rejuvenate from that. That's not a problem. Um, now, if you've got an eight-foot hydrangea, you want it to be a three-foot hydrangea, it's going to take a couple years. Because I'm going to say take that eight-foot hydrangea, cut it down to four feet. It's going to grow another foot this year. Then next year, it's going to grow a little bit. Then you can cut it down to three feet that next year. So we can do it in stages if we need to. So again, pruning is, is tricky, but overall, do it when the blooms fade. It's the easiest way to remember. If we know what type of hydrangea you've got, we can get a little bit more specific, but best time is even with your repeat blooming hydrangeas, because they're going to bloom on old wood and new wood, we still want to wait until after the blooms fade, go in there, give it a nice prune, nice shear, let it refurbish before the end of the year, and then that way you'll get blooms um, next year twofold. You'll get the old growth and the new growth. So hopefully that helps with pruning. I know that can be kind of tricky, a little complicated, but I hope that helped. All right, real quick, we're going to talk about disease and insects. There's not a whole lot of disease and insect issues, so that's what's kind of cool about hydrangeas. We don't have a lot of issues. Now, probably the most common one, especially in our area, is going to be black spot, a fungus, a bacterial leaf spot. You're going to see it on the leaves. It's going to be a little black spot all over the leaves. That's very, very common in this area. What can happen, it's spread by air. So again, we have windy conditions. We've got wet overcast conditions that just help spread that disease, um, but it's easy to cure. And so what you want to use is, get my treatments up here, is a broad spectrum fungicide. So this is our Fertilone broad spectrum fungicide. This is a great one to use if you have it already and you've got it on your plant and we need to spray and treat for it. This is the best one to use. It'll, well, it's not going to cure it. It's not going to make the black spots disappear, but it's going to help to stop it from spreading and getting really bad. Now, if you've got overhead irrigation, that is one cause of that issue. So don't have overhead irrigation. Again, we never want to water over top of our plants. We don't want to water the leaves. We want to keep the water at the base of the plant. Rainwater, different subject. Can't control that. Can't stop it from getting on the leaves. Um, but typically it's not going to be the reason that you have it. Uh, typically it's going to be that you're watering the leaves or it just spread naturally. And we can cure it. So we want to use this if you've got it. Broad spectrum fungicide if you have it. Same with powdery mildew. Powdery mildew is another common thing that a lot of hydrangeas can get in this area. So powdery mildew, broad spectrum fungicide. Very easy one to use. If you want to go organic, uh, this one's very safe. We've used it for a long time. You can use this on vegetables, lots of different things. But if you want to go organic, copper soap by Natural Guard is another great option. Uh, not as strong, so it's going to take a couple more treatments with it. But broad spectrum is one of your best if you've got it. Now, if you've got it and you use broad spectrum, that's going to help stop it. It's going to help maintain it, control it. When all those leaves fall off your plant, they're going to go dormant in the fall. When all the leaves fall off, then you want to rake all that leaf litter up and get it out of there. Because that's still got the disease in it, still got the fungal, the bacterial leaf spot in it. And so if you can get all those leaves out, uh, throw them away in the trash can, don't put them in the compost pile, put them into the, into the trash can, uh, then that will help next year. Now next year, if you had it this year, then use a systemic fungicide as a preventative. Always better to be preventative than curative. Can you use this if you have it? Yes. It's not quite as strong, it's not quite as fast acting as a broad spectrum. So just this broad spectrum is going to get to work right away. The systemic is going to take a little bit of time to get to work. Now you can use just this if you want to. Personal preference, up to you. But if you had black spot last year, and you use this this year when the leaves have hardened off, so you want to wait till the leaves harden off, come out of the plant, harden off, become that normal size leaf, then you go and spray with a systemic fungicide, then you won't have it this year. And if you do get it, it'll be very intermittent, a couple spots here and there. That means you're getting better. Rake all the leaves out again in the fall and winter, dispose of them, and then keep treating with a systemic fungicide as a preventative. So can have curative properties. Better as a preventative for our bacterial leaf spot. 
This is curative or maintenance. This is going to help maintain if you get it. And those go both for powdery mildew or black spot. And that's pretty much it for as far as diseases go on hydrangeas. You're not going to have a lot of other diseases. Um, now, depending on the area you live in, you might have some other issues, but those are still going to be your solutions for your fungus issues typically. Are those two things. If you got the fungus, spray broad spectrum to cure it, to stop it in its tracks. Use a systemic fungicide the next year to prevent it. Get all that leaf litter out. It's the best way to prevent it from spreading. Get the leaf litter out of there. Uh, insects. Not a lot of major insect issues. Slugs. A lot of people might have issues with slugs. I know when I grew a hydrangea in a container for many years, I had lots of slug issues with them. You can use... Do I have it around here? Well, I know I didn't bring it. But we've got a slug and snail bait um, that works really well. I thought I didn't grab it out there. Natural guard, slug and snail bait. So this will kill slug and snails. Naturally, you can spread it right around the hydrangea. You can put it in the top of the pot. You can put it around the pot if it's in a garden setting. Uh, you can put this around the plant outside. It's completely safe, completely organic. But this is a great one from Natural Guard, slug and snail bait. That will kill your slugs or snails if you have issues with those. You might have other issues, white flies, a little bit of scale sometimes will get in there, aphids, very infrequently, but can happen to hydrangeas. And there you want to just use any kind of over the, you know, regular organic insecticide. You can use our Be Safe 3 in 1. You can use uh, Spinosad soap. You can use a lot of different things. Uh, those are pretty soft bodied, easy to kill insects. So, of course, if you ever have those issues, let us know. We can help get the right treatment for you. But typically, it's that bacterial leaf spot. That is one of the most common ones that we see. The little black spot all over all your leaves, makes it kind of look gnarly, makes it kind of look ugly. Now I think I saw, let's see if I've got it. Yep, I grabbed an oak leaf. Now this isn't a great image of it, but you can see those black spots. And that happens. Now that's somewhat natural. Um, my feeling is, is that this is actually winter damage. This probably leafed out, and then we got that cold snap and got a little bit of winter damage. But this will give you kind of an idea of what it looks like. You're going to see black or brown spots all over the leaves, that's pretty common in this area. You're not the only one that has it. Use the broad spectrum to get rid of it. Rake up the leaf litter. Use the systemic uh, fungicide as a preventative next year, and you'll be cured. Pretty simple. So that's kind of our disease and insect issues. So that really covers the gamut. Now, again, I said there's lots and lots of varieties out there. Don't worry about the science or the Latin names and getting really specific about your varieties. Know if it's a repeat bloomer, that might help you, but again, not super important on when to prune your hydrangeas. Look at your sizes. Look at the different sizes of the plants. Is this going to be in the right size range? Some get 5x5, five five, some get 2x2. Two two. So know the size. So always read your tag and know which size you have. I don't want to get specific about varieties because there's so many out there. There's so many different ones out there. Um, I will tell you this because I forgot to mention it. Some red varieties, so some of our dark red or pink very dark pink blooming hydrangeas. Those are typically dwarfs. Um, they're, they're typically going to be in that two by two range. Uh, one of the, the new ones by In the Summer is Summer Crush. So there you can see that bloom color on that flat on that tag. This one's been pruned back, so you can see it's still trying to spit out some more blooms. But Summer Crush, you cannot change the color of the, of the, of the bloom. It's always going to be that red to pink color. Now, if your pH gets a little bit lower, it might not be as intense, so we might want to raise the pH to get the intensity up. But they're also typically going to be dwarf. So I just did throw that out there. There are some pink, red varieties that you can't change the color. So again, reading your tag will tell you. If the tag says the pH will change the color, then you know you can change the color. If it says it's a repeat bloomer, that will tell you that it blooms on old wood and new wood. It does help to kind of know those things. But a lot of us have hydrangeas in the yard, so hopefully by me describing all the different types of hydrangeas helps you understand what, what you might have and might help you, again, determine when to prune them. Let's talk about, again, the safest time to prune our hydrangeas or when the blooms fade. It's the easiest way to remember um, how to control that, that or when to prune is once the blooms have fade, that's the best time to prune. It's kind of an easy reminder on all of them. If we know specifically what we have, if we know it's a panicle style, if we know it's got this cone-shaped bloom, it's a little lime, lime light, one of those, um, we know we can prune in the winter, you're going to get a little bit of a better bloom set. Uh, but if you prune in the summer, you're still going to be okay, and you're still going to be safe. So again, that helps kind of describe that. 
Lots and lots of different varieties out there. Pinks, blues, whites, they're gorgeous plants. Plant them in your landscape, plant them in a container. Use them, they are amazing, amazing garden landscape plants in containers. There's so many different uses for them, so many different colors. The joy of being able to change the color of your bloom on a plant from one year to the next is so much fun and so easy. Sometimes you can get multicolored. You know, I've taken and thrown lime underneath one of my hydrangeas on just one half, and then the, the blooms come out in this multi, multicolored shrub. It's really cool because we've got different pHs working in that area. Do lots of different things. You can change it. You can have fun with them. They're easy to prune. You don't have to prune them. They're very low maintenance once you find the right spots. Awesome plants in masses. Plant a bunch of them. Plant a row of them. Plant a hedge of them. Plant one as a specimen. Put some hydrangeas in your yard is what I'm saying. They are awesome, awesome plants. Um, so I know that you probably have lots of questions. I'm going to come over and start answering some of your questions. Hopefully they're still on there. Um, I hope you enjoy this. I hope you got a lot out of this. Um, I know it's a, it's a tricky topic sometimes for us to understand. I hope the information that I gave you helps determine exactly what you need um, to, to change your pH, to prune your plant properly. I hope all of that helped. I will come over and answer your questions now. If you take off, thanks for coming. Thanks for seeing us. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll be here again uh, this Friday. We've got another seminar at 11 o'clock, and then we've got two next week for National Pollinator Week. We've got pollinators coming. Um, so we've got two on how to attract pollinators to your yard using plants or accessories. So those will be two fun uh, seminars as well next week, so as we kind of uh, encourage our pollinators to stick around. Um, got lots and lots of information there. I hope you enjoy this. Hope you have a great day. Enjoy the weather. Get, get out in the garden. Plant some hydrangeas. Prune your hydrangeas. Hopefully I gave you the information to do so correctly. Ask me some questions. I'm going to stick around and answer all your questions now. Have a great day if you leave. Bye. Okay. So I'll try and look up at the camera. <laughs> Not down too much. But I'm going to go through and see if I can get the questions answered here. So I know um, some of the questions sometimes filter off of this um, as we continue to go along. So if I don't answer your question, um, I will go back um, as soon as I end this live seminar and go and answer your questions then. Um, so if you want your question answered and I missed it before and it doesn't seem like I'm getting to it, um, it's not because I'm ignoring it, it's just it filtered off my, my view. Uh, we haven't quite figured out how to be able to continue to view all the comments. Um, so Ashley says, I've been growing Lily of the Valley since, 2000, uh, since 2013 and I just lost it. Okay, let me go down a couple. I have a couple of Annabelle hydrangeas and the blooms get so big they fall over when it rains. Should I stake them? You can. Annabelle's are smooth hydrangeas. Smooth hydrangeas uh, can be pruned in the winter. So know that with your Annabelle. Prune it this winter. Try that if you're not doing that already. Um, what that will do is encourage growth to come out of stronger wood. And when you get bigger, stronger growth out of that stronger wood, it should be able to withstand holding up those blooms. For right now, yes, you can stake them if you want to. If they start to dry up and you're going to prune it now, what you can do, just prune it a little bit deeper so you get stronger wood coming out of it. Uh, that might help with holding up those blooms. That's a smooth hydrangea. That's very common with smooth hydrangeas if you're not pruning them in the winter time frame. So that's a specific one that you can do with that. All right, so Chris said, I just planted in April two dwarf hydrangeas that are blue and are indoor or outdoor are meant to be planted. I keep losing all my questions. All right, let me drop down a little bit. Uh, Cheryl said, I usually cut mine that are close to the soil. I cut them for inside. We seem to have lots of rain. Uh, that is true. Um, you can definitely cut them to use them inside. They make great cut flowers. Um, I usually cut you know, as much stem as I might need um, in order to fit in the vase that I'm using it in. Uh, and lots of rain. Hydrangeas love lots of rain, so they should be very happy. Other than they'll hang over a little bit, but wait till that rain stops. They'll perk back up. Karen said, I've taken two pages of notes. Good. Uh, and we're going to post our notes. Uh, gives us, give us about three or four or five days. We'll get our notes up there. All right. Everybody's saying super informative. Um, and yes, you can go back and watch. So if, if you, I know that was some informa a lot of information. If you need to go back and watch, you can definitely go back and watch anytime. Um, just go to our website. We'll have it up there as soon as we possibly can. 
Everybody's saying thanks. Does McDonald's sharpen shears or tools? We do not. Um, so Maryland, uh, we do not sharpen tools and shears. Unfortunately, it's just something that uh, we, we haven't done. We haven't done for a long time. Um, you should be able to take them to maybe like a hardware store. I hate to send you somewhere else, but that might be an option for you. I, I do have sharpening tools coming in this fall uh, because as we continue to kind of talk about pruning and how important it is to keep your shears nice and sharp, um, we'll have a pruning tool that's very easy to use. So we'll have that this fall if you want to check in for that. You can buy sharpening tools. If you want to get them sharpened, uh, you should be able to take them to a hardware store, a local hardware store, and they should be able to do it for you. All right, well, let's keep on going down. How do I propagate them? I've put branches in soil and, they, and they're rooted. Is there a way I can take a clipping off and start new plants? I tried two clippings, but I'm not sure I'm doing it right. Uh, propagation is not my forte, I guess you could say. Um, I don't know a ton about it. Here's how you do hydrangeas. Um, I do know how you can do hydrangeas. Hydrangeas are fairly easy to propagate. Um, so what you want to do is, let's see if I can do this real quick for you. Give me one sec. Get my pruners out. And let's see if I can find a piece of wood here that I can show you. So you always want to propagate from green stems. So you see that nice green stem right there? That's what we want to propagate from is that green stem. We don't want to use a brown woody stem. It's not going to work as well. What I'm going to do is I've cut, as you can see, about six inches. It depends on how much you cut. I typically say about six to eight inches. Um, I'm going to take these lower leaves off. So we're just going to pull these off. And then I'm going to make a cut at a 45 degree angle so that I've got this nice, let's see if you can see that. See that 45 degree angle? So I've got that nice cut. What that's going to do is give you a little bit more surface area. Then get a rooting hormone if you can. That would help. You don't have to have it, but that does help. And then dip it in water, dip it in the rooting hormone, put it in some soil. And then you want to keep it kind of evenly moist. Now some people are going to say to cover it in a bag or something. You can do that. If you're doing it right now, keep it outside in a shady spot in some nice potting soil, professional potting soil like our McDonald potting soil. Um, I might recommend all-purpose potting soil because it does dry out a little bit better. It's better for seed starting or propagation than our natural and organic potting soil. Natural and organic potting soil has an aloe wetting agent in it, which might make it stay wet too long. But that's what you want to do. Some people will say only keep two leaves on it. So you can take it up to there and just keep those two leaves on it. But that's what you want to do. Cut it at a 45 degree angle. Then in about two or three weeks, just go and give it a little tug on it. And if you feel like there's some resistance, then you've got roots and you've propagated your hydrangea. And that's how you do that. I will tell you, it's a, it's a slow process. It's a painstaking process. A lot of times people experience rot with it. Uh, that can happen. I don't recommend sticking it in a glass of water on the windowsill and seeing if it roots out. That typically doesn't work very well with hydrangeas. So that's how you would do with hydrangeas. That's as much information as I have on propagation. I apologize. Uh, if you do go on the websites, on websites, Always check out your EDUs. I always tell you, uh, you know, that use the, the websites that you know are going to have knowledge. So anything that ends in EDU is going to come from a school, um, uh, a college, that's going to have good educational uh, information on there. So Virginia Tech might have something on propagating uh, hydrangeas. But also, uh, you can check out some of the best growers' websites. Maybe Monrovia or Proven Winners um, is going to have something on that. So don't just go on a gardening website that maybe doesn't have great information. Check out some of your, your bigger uh, 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 colleges or your uh, bigger companies that are talking about them. They might have a little bit more. I just, I'm, I'm just never been a propagation expert. It's something I need to learn, but I do know that much on hydrangeas. Cut about six to eight inches stems. Take off the bottom leaves. Have a couple of leaves on top. You do want to keep these. Rooting hormone, 45 degree angle. Put it in some soil, that should propagate your hydrangea for you. All right, so let's see where we're at now. I know I answered, that took me a while to answer that one. Half the leaf is turning brown, not dry, crispy, just brown. Um, so it sounds like it could be a little bit of a um, uh, 
probably not a bacterial leaf spot. Uh, might be too much moisture, might be getting too much moisture. And Anne, I don't know, and Anne was the one that asked that question, Anne Marie. Um, I don't know if that's a recently planted plant, if that was recently planted and you're getting those issues where it's not crispy brown, they're just turning brown, um, then it could be too much moisture. So if you've just planted and it's getting a lot of moisture, that might be the issue. Let it dry out before you water again. And again, never water the leaves. And if you have a leaf that you can bring in, then it might help us look, uh, look at it a little bit closer. Darlene said, informative class, very straightforward, good. Um, I've decided not to prune mine, uh, not to prune, and mine uh, keep growing bigger and bigger. Beth, uh, or Karen, I think was replying to Beth's comment, yeah, if you don't prune them, they can get huge. Um, so Karen, Karen found our videos, and I think is calling her husband the plant butcher. <laughs> Um, so everybody's saying great information, this has been perfect. See some comments about pruning and different uh, people saying people are, are uh, pruning their crepe myrtles too hard. Mary, thanks for your great comment. Thank you very much. Um, Which type will turn dark purple? What can I give the bush to get dark purple? I have forever bloomers and old mop heads. Um, so purple is, is, is a tricky one. Uh, purple is always going to be in that range typically of six to seven. So what I would do is add lime. And Gina, this is your question. Um, there, there are some varieties that do get a little bit better purple color. Um, and those are going to be like uh, bloomstruck from Endless Summer is a very good variety. Again, reading your plant labels will always tell you kind of what you can do with your, your bloom colors. And again, you can always check those websites out uh, to get a little bit more specific on specific varieties. But your range of, of, of pH is gonna be anywhere from that six to seven. And you're gonna to wanna to be pushing that seven range to get the darker purple. Um, so uh, try that. See if you can get a little bit higher in that pH with your lime, and that should push that purple color a little bit more. Um, and then for the forever bloomers or old mop heads, um, might be a little bit trickier. Again, just playing with your pH and seeing if you can get it right. You can also buy a pH tester. They're very inexpensive. Put your pH tester in the area, get you kind of a little bit close to where you need to know. Most of the local garden centers, I know we do it, but if you don't live in the area, most local garden centers um, uh, do free pH testing. Uh, which will get you a little bit more specific, and you're going to want to get a little bit more specific about what your pH is um, and how much to apply. Um, and again, all your packages will tell you how much to apply. Typically a cup to two or three cups of lime, depending on the size of the plant, is how much you want to use to change your pH of point. But if you need to change it 0.5, we need to look at that. So if you can get real specific on what type of hydrangeas you have, or um, what, what pH uh, you're dealing with, then we can get pretty close to getting that darker purple color. Maybe we'll get up into the pink range and we gotta bring it back down. It's gonna take some time to figure that one out. So everybody's saying thank you. Thanks heading over for the peach truck. Yeah, the peach truck's coming. Uh, So Charlene said, uh, she's, uh, I have been a customer of McDonald Garden Center since 1980, have since moved to North Carolina, but look forward to coming to your store during my visits to our summer home in Virginia Beach. We look forward to seeing you. Uh, we're still here. We'll always be here for you. Everybody's saying thanks. Uh, the deer eat my hydrangeas. What can I do to stop this? Well, deer do like hydrangeas. They typically eat the blooms and they don't eat the leaves as much, um, unfortunately. Uh, they'll typically attack the blooms, but sometimes they'll eat the leaves. Deer, it's very hard for me to say what deer resistant even means. Uh, if the deer are hungry enough, they'll eat anything. Um, I do have, of course, topical sprays that you can spray over the plant to, to deter the deer. Um, I do have a really cool systemic deer repellent. Uh, it's made by Repellex. Um, if you go and watch our mole and bowl video, I do talk about it a little bit, but if you go into, uh, if you come into one of our stores here in Virginia Beach, um, even the markets, if you live closer to Williamsburg, I don't know what area you live in, um, so Sheila, if, uh, if you live in Williamsburg, they carry the systemic deer repellent, it's a granular, you sprinkle it around the plant, it goes into the system of the plant, you do it every spring, it lasts for the entire year. So, might be a great option to keep your 
uh, hydrangeas from becoming deer food. I have rose bushes that are, so Ebony says, I have rose bushes that are being eaten by something. Evidence of holes in the leaves. Are hydrangeas a good substitute? Well, uh, if you've got roses in, in a little bit of shade, that might be causing it. Uh, hard to say what can be causing holes in the leaves of roses. So many things can do that. Japanese beetles, rose slugs, even a bacterial leaf spot can cause holes in the leaves uh, that make it look like it's being eaten, but it could just be a, a fungus. Maybe you've got it in a little bit too much shade. So if it's, if it's, if it's, if it's a rose that's in a little bit of shade, uh, a hydrangea might be a great option for you. You might try one of the panicle styles, like the limelight hydrangea. That might be a great option if you've got more sun. Most roses want sun, so if you're in a little bit of shade, yes, go to hydrangeas. You'll love it. Move the rose to full sun. Um, if you are in um, a, uh, a sunny spot, then the limelight would be the best option to replace it with. Um, or just bring in a leaf of the rose and let us look at it and see if we can determine what it is that's causing it. Maybe we can cure it. Um, so Carol says, I have three, I have a big leaf that is three years old and has never grown very much or flowered. I've moved it to a different location and it hasn't helped. Any suggestions? If the plant looks healthy and it looks like it's doing well, doesn't wilt a lot, doesn't seem stressed out all the time, we can do two things. One, we can add phosphorus. Phosphorus is what plants need to bloom, and your soil might just be lacking, lacking uh, phosphorus. Don't prune it for, obviously, a couple of years. Let's see if that helps. Uh, so add phosphorus. And then the last thing would be that Super Thrive product. I love Super Thrive. I don't have a bottle handy, uh, but Super Thrive is awesome. Again, maybe your plant is under some sort of shock. We don't know what it is, but Super Thrive will take the shock off. It'll, it's a vitamin supplement, it's not a plant food by itself, but Super Thrive will take the shock off of it, rejuvenate that plant, and hopefully get it going for you. But phosphorus might be what you need. Uh, phosphorus is a macronutrient, a big nutrient that all plants need. It's the middle number on, a fo on, on your uh, three numbers. So if you ever see a fertilizer, 1248 uh, is our fertilizer. Four would be your phosphorus, which is lower in phosphorus. We have a blooming and rooting formula that's like a 59 in phosphorus, and it's a liquid. It'll get it right to the source and get it going a little bit quicker. So phosphorus, maybe super thrive. I think that would help. Don't prune it for a couple of years. Let's see if we can generate some blooms. So I hope that helps you, Carol. Uh, best way to propagate. So Kathy, I hope you saw my answer. Uh, I hope that will tell you how to propagate. Again, I'm not the propagation expert. Uh, I've just never been. I'm sorry. Um, but I do kind of always try and learn a little bit. And that's how I was always taught uh, the propagation of, of hydrangeas. I'm sure there's air layering techniques. I don't think there's a lot of grafting techniques. I could be wrong. But just growing them from cuttings, just like I said earlier, 45 degree angle, take off the leaves, put it in some rooting hormone, put it in some soil. Keep it evenly moist. Uh, Cheryl said, so fortunate my landscape was professionally done years ago, I inherited the gorgeous yard. Isn't that nice? <laughs> How do I cut to bring inside? Char Charlene, uh, what I do typically is just look for nice long straight stems, cut them, even if they've got a little bit of curve to them, it's okay, those can be on the outside of a bouquet, so I can always kind of group them, I've got my curved ones going this way and this way and this way, and then I've got some straight ones in the center. Uh, but typically give yourself enough stem. And you're not going to hurt the hydrangea by cutting it deep. Like I mentioned earlier, when we prune, and we prune into deeper wood, stronger wood, we're going to get bigger bloom sets the next time. We're going to get stronger growth out of that than if we just cut that bloom off with that little weak wood at the top. Uh, so hopefully that helps you, Charlene. Um, Carolyn said, this spring I had a few shoots on my mop head that had leaves and flowers on the tip, and then some bare wood. What causes this? So I had a few shoots on my mop head that had leaves and flowers on the tip. And then some bare wood. Oh, okay. So yeah, that is common, um, especially as you get an older hydrangea. Uh, you'll have some older wood that the leaves won't come out of. So that, what you're saying there is you've got some bare sections of the stem. That's pretty normal. Typically, you're not going to see it because your bush is going to be so nice and full. If you are seeing it, then I would recommend as soon as your blooms have finished this year, so this, you know, in the next two or three or four weeks, uh, as soon as those blooms start to fade on you or you're out there kind of taking some in and you're ready to prune it, now's the time. In the next, you know, somewhere six to eight weeks, we want to get our hydrangeas pruned. Um, go ahead and give it a nice, good prune at that point. Give it a little bit of plant food. Make sure not to do it during that stressed out time. 
Uh, and Carolyn, that should take care of some of those uh, old pieces of wood that aren't generating leaves. And so you've got this kind of little bloom on top of this little spindly piece, and that's from weak wood. So old, weak wood. We want to encourage new growth this year so that next year you get that big bloom set on it. So pruning in the next couple weeks, giving a nice prune, getting some of that weaker wood out, just keeping the stronger wood, that might help you get a nice prettier hydrangea next year. Uh, I have a row of, uh, so Ann says, I have a row of eastern facing pine trees and would like to plant a bunch of hydrangeas between them. Do you think they would grow well there? Morning sun, afternoon shade. And I don't know that there's a better situation for hydrangeas. They love being underneath pine trees. You're going to get blue. It's going to be an acidic soil for sure. Um, it's going to be hard to get them ever to be pink, uh, the ones that change colors. So if you want a pink, you might get a variety that stays pink and doesn't change. Um, but yes, they're going to grow and they're great, all varieties. The panicle style, oak leaf hydrangeas, old fashioned mop heads, all of them are going to love that condition. You couldn't have asked for a better condition. Azaleas, hydrangeas, camellias, Love being underneath pine trees. You got a great situation there. Uh, Kat said, or Kate, we lost a big oak that provided afternoon shade over a large bed of hydrangeas. Now they get more afternoon sun uh, than they like. They are 10 to 15 year olds. Can they safely be transplanted? Kate, yes, they can. Um, so you can transplant them. Uh, what I would do is wait till the fall because they're older ones. Uh, transplanting hydrangeas, I didn't talk about it, really can be done at any time. Um, Sometimes if they're younger and they're smaller, I might wait till the, um, until the spring to do it. And the reason I would wait till spring is because at least I can see the leaves and see how they're doing. Uh, but because they're older, they're going to take better to a root cutting this fall or winter. And so I would definitely do it in the fall if you can, because that's when roots regenerate and grow. Uh, I don't know if I can reach my... This will be your best friend, Kate. Biotone starter will regenerate some of those roots and get them going again. So I know they're going to be big and old. Give them a little bit of prune this summer. So if they're the mop head varieties, I think that's kind of what you said was 10 to 15 years old. So I think they're probably the big leaf varieties would be my guess. Give them a prune, a fairly good prune this summer um, to, to eliminate some of that top growth, some of its size because they're big. Um, prune them back probably by about half once the flowers begin to fade. Prune them back, give them a little bit of plant food, give them a little support then. And then in the fall, uh, typically around October, November, then go in, dig them out, transplant them. The most important thing is to keep the situation the same. So typically transplanting is a difficult subject. Maybe that would make a great seminar is just transplanting in general. But you're going to get more of a bowl-shaped root ball rather than a container-grown root ball. So, you know, uh, a pot, you get, okay, that's how I need to dig the hole. When you transplant, you're going to get more of a bowl-shaped uh, root ball, which is very common. So when you dig your hole, dig it in a bowl shape. You're going to have to get down on your hands and knees and make sure you can backfill into that shape pretty well. Um, and then you've got a similar situation, so as long as you plant it in a similar situation, water it. It's a brand new plant. Pretend it's a brand new plant. So you're going to want to water it every two to three weeks, or sorry, every two to three days for two to three weeks. Get it established. Fall is when root systems grow. So it's going to be producing all, all that chlorophyll, all that food that it's been producing is going to blow up into the root system. You're going to give it some biotone starter, which is going to help the root system. Um, and then that's going to regenerate the uh, root system and get it going. And then by the spring, should be perfectly fine, should be good. Watch it through that first summer. Make sure it's got enough root system to support itself through that, that first summer and then you should be fine. And you might also find that if you go to look at some of those old hydrangeas, you might find you've got a couple different plants in there and you can spread them out. A lot of times hydrangeas will multiply and you might get a hydrangea clump and then you might have another little clump off to the side that you can dig up and move around. But hydrangeas are pretty easy to transplant. So Stephanie says, the marks on my leaves are black and shaped like worms. Still use the broad spectrum fungicide. Uh, hard to say on that one. That one I might want to see uh, to see if maybe that, that's a different issue. Um, but my guess would be that it's some sort of fungicide, so you're probably safe using the broad spectrum. Um, most likely it's a fungicide. Most insects aren't going to cause that. Uh, the only downfall would be that it's getting too wet or too dry and that's causing that. Typically that's going to be on the leaf edges. Um, so if you've got worm-shaped brown lines on it, 
probably a fungus. Uh, might not be the bacterial leaf spot, might be some other type of fungus that uh, isn't popping to, to the top of my mind. Uh, and then the broad spectrum is going to work. So Stephanie, that's probably what I would do is get the broad spectrum. If you can bring in a leaf, let us look at it. Uh, that might also help us identify exactly what it is. Georgia said, I love your presentation. Thanks for joining. Thanks for watching. I have at least 20 plants for over a period of 20 years. My favorite flower. Thanks for the info. I love hydrangeas. All right, so Beth said, I have four hydrangeas planted around a tree. The two with more afternoon shade seem to be bigger and stronger. The two that get the most afternoon sun aren't as strong. Is there something I can do to help them versus transplant them? Uh, Beth, not a whole lot that you can really do. Um, they're going to be a little bit more stressed out because they're getting more sun than they want. And so stressed out plants aren't going to grow as big and vigorous as the ones that are in the proper spot. Um, what I might do, um, or what I might recommend in your situation, is if that area dries out a little bit more than the ones that are in more shade, um, then take a little bit of peat moss the next time you go to mulch. Put some peat moss around the top of the, of the soil. That will hold some moisture in. And then put your mulch over the top of that. Make sure you're mulching them. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, that Super Thrive product. Super Thrive might be a great option to kind of help take the stress off of uh, the plant that is getting a little bit too much sun. So hopefully that helps. But peat moss will really help, and it will work its way into the soil and help hold in some moisture. If that might be the cause, because they're drying out more frequently than the ones in the shade. It's going through more stress. So that should definitely help. Super Thrive, you'll love though. I love that product. It's awesome on it. And it's not that you can't grow hydrangeas in a little bit more sun. It's not that they're ever get, never going to catch up. They just might need a little bit more help. Um, and that vitamin supplement would definitely help. All right, great presentation. Thanks, everybody. Um, when is the best time to transplant pieces that have rooted themselves? Once they have a good root system, so I leave them in the pot till I know I've got a good root system that can take uh, going into the soil because in a pot I can control the amount of water it's getting. It's a little bit easier for me to control that. In the ground, if it doesn't have a very good root system and it just went through all that rain that we just got locally, um, it might not be able to take that. Um, so in a pot I can control it, but once I know that it's got a good, fairly strong root system, you're pretty safe to go into the ground. Fall, again, is another good time because fall is a great time to plant. you got a longer season before summer hits. The roots are going to be able to establish themselves, get going, and then you're ready to roll and, uh, by the next summer. It should be established. Can neem oil be used on these? Yes, neem oil can certainly be used on hydrangeas if you think you need for an insect issue or even fungus. Um, neem oil does have a fungus killing property. It, all neem oils work in the same way. They're suffocants. They're going to suffocate the insect or the fungus out. It's not going to allow oxygen into it, so you want to coat the plant. Uh, so what you want to be careful of is don't spray it when the temperatures are above 90 degrees and you have sun on the plant. Most hydrangeas should be in a little bit of shade anyways, so you shouldn't have to worry about it too, too much. Just watch your temperatures. Make sure you're not spraying it on an above 90 degree day. That's the safest thing you can do with neem oil. But neem oil, yes, you can definitely use. Many, uh, Cheryl says, many of mine are eight feet tall. It's okay not to prune. Cheryl, it certainly is. I mean, if you're okay with them that size, I mean, plants don't need to be pruned. I mean, we're the only ones that really prune them. <laughs> In nature, they just grow and grow and grow. If you're seeing less bloom um, or, or you're seeing weaker branching or you're seeing any issues, pruning might help. But if you're okay with the size and they're gorgeous, don't touch them. Why mess with them? Keep feeding them. Keep mulching them. Do those things. Water them during drought times. Other than that, let them grow. I mean, the only time you would ever, well, I would recommend pruning is if you've got weaker wood, they're starting to collapse all the time, they don't look real great, they're not blooming as profusely, that was, that's when I would go in and start talking about pruning. But you don't have to. Does adding worms to the soil help hydrangeas get established? If you've got worms, hydrangeas will love it. All plants do. All plants love worms being in the soil. They, uh, they help decompose organic matter, turn it into a natural fertilizer. Worms are great. Do you need worms? You don't have to have them. But if you got them, great. They definitely won't hurt. They will only help. Um, Sharon said, ideas for getting bigger blooms from mop heads. Some of my endless summer bushes have smaller blooms as opposed to less larger blooms. Goes back to my pruning comment just a second ago, uh, Sharon, but uh, that would be my thought is, is blooming them a little, or is, is to prune them. So again, weaker wood is going to produce a, a weaker stem, a, a weaker bloom head. So weaker wood you don't want. 
So you want to eliminate weaker wood by pruning into thicker wood. The thicker the wood that you prune into, the stronger the next shoot will come out of. Uh, let's see if I've got a good example here I can show you. Mm, let's see. I, nothing really here. Most of our hydrangeas are so fresh and new, they don't have a lot of... Um, here's, a, here's a good example, though. Here's something that I can show you. Let's see if you can see this. So there's a prune right there. I don't know if you can see that. But there's a prune right there by my pinky. Right there. That you can see it was pruned into some weaker wood. And then I get these little weaky kind of flowers. But then over here, I've got this nice strong bloom. And it's coming out of much stronger wood. So again, hard to kind of show you on the screen. Uh, if you come to the garden center, we can show you. But what I'm talking about is... Don't just prune small pieces of wood. Go a little bit deeper. If we can go a little bit deeper into the plant, a little bit deeper down, a little bit further down the branch, let's say six or seven leaf nodes before we prune, then you can get a much stronger shoot of growth out of the stronger wood than you will out of weaker wood. And I think that'll help you in the summers. Now in the summers, if they're young, are going to be kind of slow to kind of catch up. Once they get established, you can go and prune them. Again, when do you want to prune it in the summers? Is after the blooms begin to fade. So if you're, if you're doing a little bit of deadheading, if I'm taking one of those blooms off, just make sure you're going down into some stronger wood, the strongest wood you can get to, um, without going all the way to the bottom to cut it all the way off. Uh, just go into some, some stronger wood. I think that will help your blooms. Phosphorus, again, if your soil is lacking phosphorus, it's not going to produce as heavily of a bloom. Plant food, just in general, will help. It takes a lot of energy to produce these gorgeous blooms. So if we're not feeding our plants properly, which is typically you know, two or three times a year, then we're not going to get as big of a bloom set. Uh, let's see. Uh, Ebony said, is this a good replacement for rose bushes that have been invaded by aphids? Uh, so Ebony, again, if, if it's got some shade, yes. If it's in full sun, stick with the paniculata varieties, the panicle varieties. Uh, they can take the most sun. Um, and uh, so if you've got a lot of aphid issues, then yes, aphids, if you've got them in the area, you definitely want to treat for them before we go and plant a new plant. Uh, because aphids, while they don't love hydrangeas, they can get on them. For sure, aphids will eat pretty much any plant. Um, so Becca said, I'm new to Virginia and clay. I know, clay, clay is not a bad soil. Very good soil. Uh, if, you're, if you want to talk soil, go and watch my seminar. I spent an hour talking about soil uh, in general. So uh, go and check out that video. It's got a lot of information on soil and clay, how good it is. We just need to amend it to make it a little bit better. All right, so Andrew said, I planted a hydrangea five years ago, and I'm just now seeing blooms. Any idea why? So, Andrew, hard to say. Um, again, variety, most varieties should bloom pretty quickly. Um, you know, some plants like native dogwoods take 10 to 15 years to bloom. Um, but most hydrangeas should bloom pretty much right away. It might have just gone through an acclimation period where there was some sort of stressor. We don't know what it was. It was stressed out. Plants bloom to reproduce, but they will only do that if they will survive it. So if they're not going to survive a, uh, a bloom cycle, then it's not going to do it. It's like why fruit trees drop a lot of their fruit sometimes. Because they know they won't be able to survive if they try and maintain all of it. So plants won't bloom if they know they're not going to survive through it. So maybe there was some sort of stressor. Maybe there wasn't a readable source of, uh, of phosphorus. So phosphorus, again, is going to help them bloom. Maybe it was just going through a little bit of transplant shock. Hard to say specifically, but at least it's blooming now. Let's keep it going, hopefully. Um, so Wendy said, so if, bloom, if blooms are blue, it's a mop head. I inherited my bush, and I don't know the top. Uh, the type. Um, so yes, if it's a blue and it's got kind of this mop head look to it, it's most likely a big leaf variety. Now, what I didn't mention, I probably should have, uh, but what I'll tell you now is if um, old-fashioned hydrangeas only bloom, so old-fashioned big leaf varieties only bloom on old wood. They don't, they're not newer varieties. Newer varieties are the ones that bloom on old and new wood. So again, if, if, you've, if, if that's what you think you have, then prune it when the blooms are finished and they're starting to dry up or they're starting to fade a little bit, prune it then. Um, to change the color, you should be able to change it. You can always test it. Adding lime to a hydrangea that's blue um, will most likely turn it pink if you want to. But if you want to keep it blue, keep it blue. It should be gorgeous. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
Um, I bought some from Northwest, and they died in uh, Texas. I don't know why why they did not transplant well, said Laura. So, Laura, um, so if you bought them from the Northwest, which is going to be kind of like your Oregon, Washington territory, um, and then you planted them in Texas, um, and they didn't do well, might just be too much heat. Um, Texas, I, I don't know where, I think you said Amarillo, Texas, um, so not that I, I should I should know my geography a little bit better, but um, I, I'm not quite sure where that is in the state of Texas. I think Texas is covered in pretty much all of the, the heat indexes, so five to nine. So if you're in zones five to nine, you should be safe. Um, if you're in 10, um, then it might just be too warm, and it stays too warm too long, uh, and it can't handle it. Now, Texas, of course, I think a lot of us think it's dry, it's arid, there's not a lot of moisture there, um, so if that's an issue, that might be the cause. Uh, maybe you don't have a lot of shade on it, um, but they grow great in Oregon and Washington and um, in the, in the Northwest, um, but they, they might not grow as well in Texas. Again, we just have to amend our soil, make sure there's plenty of organic matter, it's holding moisture, it's in some shade. Um, and hopefully that will help. Uh, and there are some varieties, again, always check. There might be a variety that only grows in zones five to seven, five to eight, but almost everything that I look at says five to nine, um, maybe even four to nine. Ebony said it is in the shade. So if your rose is in the shade, put it in the sun, get yourself some hydrangeas for the shade. I think you got a great answer, Ebony. Um, I use, um, I've used deer and small animals called Deer Away. Work great, work the price of animals, safe won't hurt any of our friends. So Cheryl, yes, uh, lots of deer repellents that are very safe and easy to use. Um, and then of course, I've got that systemic one that is great, safe for the plant too. It's all organic. It's actually capsaicin. Um, so it's just hot peppers. Uh, so everybody's saying, thank you, this is awesome. I'm enjoying my hydrangeas. My hydrangeas tend to come uh, back over the winter. I live in Minnesota, or I think that's what Minnesota am in, or the mountains. This year, I put three overripe bananas around where they were planted. I let them, I left them alone. Came back uh, later, I would have thought, maybe years, I dug them out thinking, let's see what else this says. Uh, I think we had any suggestions. Uh, Dorothy, hard to tell what would happen there. Um, so if they're, if they're coming back um, over the winter, that means your winters are warming up a little bit quicker um, than, than we do. Um, and, and sometimes that'll happen. We'll get some warm spells. You'll start to see the leaf buds starting to pop back out. Um, and so sometimes that can hurt a hydrangea is if it leafed out completely and then we got a really, really cold snap and it froze all those new leaf buds. Most hydrangeas should kick back out of that. But sometimes I've seen them not come back. And that can happen, unfortunately. That's just Mother Nature. You know, all of a sudden it thought it was spring, all the leaves started to emerge, and then we got another week of cold weather. Um, that can severely hurt a hydrangea for sure, sometimes even kill it. So maybe that's it. I doubt it was the bananas. I don't know if the bananas, uh, that's just potassium. Shouldn't have hurt them. Um, so I doubt that could have caused it. Uh, so I think you're okay there. Cheryl said, this is fabulous, great, I'm glad. Uh, Love to have you present a show on gardenias. Great option. Gardenias are, are a fun one to talk about as well. I could probably talk about that for a long time. Uh, Emily said, best to plant an organic soil. Yes, always use organic soil. It's a great option. Just amend your soil with it. In a container, potting soil, in the ground, organic matter, which is compost, organic compost, your soil, and perlite. A third of each. Emily said, check out the soil. Literally. Yes, check that out. You'll love it. Uh, we, so Doug says we have a very old hydrangea that was transplanted several years ago. It bloomed a couple of years and now we've just been getting healthy looking green leaves and no blooms. So Doug, um, again, make sure you're not pruning it at the improper time. If it's an old hydrangea, you said it's an old hydrangea, it might only bloom on old wood, which means all the growth that you get this year is what it's going to bloom on next year. So don't prune it too late because you'll be pruning off your blooms. So prune it now. If you don't have any blooms and you want to prune it and you need to prune it, prune it now. You don't have any blooms on it anyways. Let all that new growth come back out on it and then next year you should get more blooms if you're pruning it at the wrong time. If you weren't, again, kind of goes back to my comments from earlier. Maybe you're lacking some phosphorus, so maybe we need to add some more phosphorus to help set those blooms. Plants need phosphorus to bloom. So let's see if maybe that's it could be going through a little bit of shock, and we don't know what the shock is. You said it was transplanted, so maybe it's a little bit of transplant shock. Although, you said several years ago, so I would have thought it would have kicked out of that by now. 
Super Thrive. It's a very friendly uh, thing to have around. I always have a little bottle of it in my garage. It goes a long way. You can always get a little bit of Super Thrive. just kind of takes the shock off of plants. That might help. Phosphorus, a little bit of Super Thrive maybe. Make sure to mulch it. Prune it at the right time. I think those will get you to blooming again. Um, I'm told I can't plant, plant hydrangeas near my walnut tree. Is that true? If it's a black walnut, for sure. Other walnut trees, you should be fine. Black walnuts, most... I don't think there's anything that really grows underneath black walnut trees. So I don't know what type of walnut tree you have. If it's just a regular walnut tree, it should be fine. Black walnuts, nothing grows under black walnuts. So no, you won't be able to grow hydrangeas there, sorry. Um, that's just a weird thing that black walnuts kind of like sterilize the soil around it. Marianne said, other than the obvious method of watching new growth for blooms, is there any way to tell if established plants at home were purchased or repeat blooming? Um, so Mary Ann, if you want to try and determine if it's a repeat bloomer, um, then if you prune it this winter and you get blooms this next summer, you'll know. If you don't want to do that, just enjoy your hydrangea. Um, what you can do is you can mark some um, old wood and you can prune it in the summer so you can just take a little bit of like tape or something, you know, a little tie, tie one of your branches, cut it, and then if that produces new growth and produces a bloom, then you know it's a repeat bloomer. Um, so that's kind of how you can tell. Typically what I tell people is if your hydrangea comes out, puts a big bloom set, and then does another bloom set, it's a repeat bloomer. If it just comes out and produces a big bloom set and it never produces another bloom set after that, it's not a repeat bloomer. It's an old-fashioned mop head hydrangea. All right, so Wendy says, okay, so my hydrangea never puts out much growth at all on old wood, but it always puts out lots of new stems from the root that bloom profusely, huge blooms. That confuses me as a type of plant, but it grows fine, so that's okay. Wendy, yep, if it grows fine, then that's okay. Old wood sometimes won't produce very good blooms. Um, a, a lot of times you'll find dead wood in your hydrangeas too. Um, so like I said, in the spring when you're starting to leaf out, if you find some branches that aren't leafing out, great time to go in and cut those out. Um, so if it's producing on new growth, um, if it's not a panicle style, if, if, it's just an, uh, if it's just a big leaf variety, a mop head, um, then that should produce on old growth as well. Um, all of them do. So it should, it shouldn't just be doing on new growth. These only do new growth. So this is only going to produce on new growth this year. So if it's this type of hydrangea, a panicle style, or a smooth hydrangea, could be a smooth hydrangea, but again, those are all white. So, uh, Wendy, if, if yours is pink or blue, then, um, then it should be blooming on old wood. And if it's blooming on new wood, then you definitely have a repeat bloomer. Tracy says, I have a Mexican sunflower and leaves are always messed up. I have tried everything. Central Florida. Tracy, hard to say what's getting into your Mexican sunflower. Uh, might be something you might want to send us a picture of. Uh, we might be able to tell you. You should be able to find a local garden center that I think would be able to help. Um, I would say since it's a sunflower, uh, try and find, if you can, um, uh, the Be Safe 3-in-1. Sunflowers, obviously the bees love them, um, and they're in there getting all the pollen, pollinating it. Um, so we don't want to hurt the bees, so you might use the Bee Safe 3-in-1, and what that is is uh, fungicide, and insecticide, and amidocide, or neem oil. Neem oil would be a good option, um, because we don't know what it is that's, that's, that's causing it. Could be a fungus. Fungus sometimes cause holes in the leaves of plants. So do insects. But at least neem oil will give you a chance of attacking both of them, whether it's a fungus or an insect. Uh, TC said, I think I have bloom struck, red stems and mop pet, but it's doing well in half sun, half shade. Should I move it to where I only get morning, five hours of sun, or side of the house that gets afternoon, six hours of sun? Not sure if this is a shade hydrangea. Um, Say if it's bloom struck, it does love shade. Um, and if it does, if it's doing well, it says it's doing well, half sun, half shade. I wouldn't move it unless you wanted to really move it. And if you do want to move it, I don't know that it would go to the spot that has the six hours of sun in the afternoon. That sounds like it's a little intense. If you want to grow a hydrangea in that space, this would be the one, the panicle style. So look for a limelight. Uh, maybe come in and, and try this flame. Uh, any of those panicle styles are going to be your best, or maybe even an oak leaf that you can try in that area if you wanted to. Oh, I said there. Uh, Marianne said, would love to also see camellias and azaleas. That would be a gorgeous 
uh, place underneath your, I think you were the one that would mention the pine trees, um, uh, or maybe you were talking about a, a, just a seminar on azaleas and camellias. We could do those as well. Uh, but Marianne, if you were the one that had the pine trees, um, then uh, camellias, azaleas, hydrangeas, all would be very, very happy in that situation. Marianne said, I missed this. Is the soil video also available on Facebook? Yeah, it should be on Facebook still. If it's not, then go to our webpage. Uh, we, we'll send you a link um, on how to find uh, those videos of the past. Um, but they're, they're still up there, and the soil one was very good. I specifically talked about soil in this area and all about soil. Um, Debbie said, thanks, learned so much. Uh, Mary said, I bought worm castings. Are they good for hydrangeas? Worm castings are great. It's a compost, basically. Um, so worm castings are amazing. Uh, if you're using the soil worm castings, mix it in with your soil. If you're using a dehydrated um, worm castings, which some people will use, then that's more of like a plant food. You can sprinkle that on the top. Top of the soil, not on the top of the leaves. Um, all right, I think I've got down to the bottom. Um, um, let's see, it does bloom all summer. That sounds like a repeat. Wendy, yep, yeah. if it's blooming all summer, and continues to kind of put out blooms, repeat bloomer. If it just does one big bloom and then it's kind of fizzles and really doesn't do much after that, it's just your old fashioned, uh, just once a bloom uh, hydrangea. So, all right, I think I've got to the end of the questions. I know I missed a bunch at the beginning, so I'll go back and see if, uh, see if there's anything there at the beginning that I need to uh, answer. So I'll answer those questions. If you didn't get your reply, then I will be answering those questions very shortly. I'm gonna take a break, and then I'll get to your questions. Uh, thanks again for joining, everybody. Uh, I knew this was gonna be a great class. Hydrangeas are a tricky one, but pretty simple. I hope I simplified it to some degree. There is one specific time that you can always prune hydrangeas, um, and that's when the, the, the blooms begin to fade. Uh, we can change the pH. You can have fun with it. They love to be in the shade. They're a great shade garden plant, but also some that can grow in full sun. Lots and lots of different types. So much fun. If you don't have a hydrangea, come in and get one. Um, if, you, if you do have hydrangeas, hopefully now you know how to care and maintain for them a little bit better. Hope you learned a lot. Y'all have a great day, and I will see you around.